what is the difference between being in ketosis or endogenously producing our own ketone bodies and supplementing with exogenous ketones? Sure. So let's first cover what ketosis is. Ketosis is essentially just a physiological state where your blood ketone levels is greater than 0.5 millimolar. So in that sense, it doesn't matter how you get there. So to get into ketosis, you can either go, you know, do it via endogenous ketones or exogenous ketones. So the state itself is independent of the means at which you use to get there. So that's the clarification there. But most people, when they talk about getting into nutritional ketosis, naturally, that's when they think of either keto diet or intermittent fasting. Because when your body is low on glycogen or glucose, that's when your body um, says, okay, we need to kick in ketogenesis, which is the process where you pro produce ketones from fats in the liver. The whole idea of why it even happens is because the brain primarily uses glucose. But when you are low on glucose, your brain still needs some form of fuel and fats can't bypass the blood-brain barrier. And therefore, it needs to be broken down into smaller molecules, i.e. ketones, that can bypass blood-brain barrier and enters the brain for energy production. Exogenous ketones, on the other hand, is essentially what it sounds like, an external source of ketones that you can directly drink or eat or, you know, some form of food product that directly increase your blood ketone levels. So regardless of whether you are on a ketogenic diet or if you're fasting or not, or even if you just had a full meal full of carbs, you can still have increased blood ketone levels. The whole mechanism of action there is that when you have glucose in your body, you have increased insulin. Insulin is what stops keto ketogenesis. It's what stops the production of ketones in your liver because insulin is an anabolic, anabolic hormone. It's basically telling your body that you have enough substrates. What you need to do is take all this sugar and store it or metabolize it. And therefore, there is no need to create another new form of, of substrates for efficiency. And when you're low on glucose, your insulin will be low as well. And that's where ketones can be produced. But with exogenous ketones, even if you have high insulin, high glucose, you can still produce that. Sorry, it's not produced. You can still have an increased amount of blood ketone levels. That's great. So, you know, one of the things that you um, said, and I'll just highlight it again, is it's a state independent. So you can be taking exogenous ketones or supplementing with ketones um, while you're in ketosis to sort of augment potentially the ketones that you're already producing, or if you're glycolytic. So like you said, you know, you could be using glucose as the substrate, mm -hmm. as well as supplementing with exogenous ketones to, let's say, augment performance or increase your mental clarity, that kind of thing. Yep. All right. So let's, let's move, let's talk a little bit about one of the things that I've noticed. There are many benefits to being in ketosis or supplementing with exogenous ketones. One of the things that I've noticed, and I think that this is important for my women in perimenopause who are maybe starting to see if they're not being strategic, maybe they're not lifting weights, they're starting to see their blood glucose levels start to climb, their fasting insulin levels start to climb. One of the things that we know around, or at least I've observed with exogenous ketone supplementation is the glu glucose lowering effect that ketones have on on our physiology. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know if you can comment on that. And if we know, like, what is, I'm, I'm just generally curious, like the mechanism behind that, like why or how are the ketones driving down blood glucose? Yeah, there are about four papers now published by University of British Columbia by Professor Jonathan Little. If you are listening, go, feel free to Google it. And it's very interesting because he started with healthy individuals and then obese individuals and then diabetic individuals all across the board when they have taken exogenous ketones they saw a glucose lowering effect, which is very interesting, right? Because we wouldn't expect that because we're just providing the body with exogenous ketones. We're just providing the body with a source of fuel, which is what ketone is. So the hypothesis around that is that ketones may send signal to the liver to decrease gluconeogenesis. So it doesn't lower glucose in the sense that it, it increases the absorption of your 
after food glucose or postprandial glucose. Rather, it just decreases your body's ability to produce glucose from other sources in the liver called gluconeogenesis. So that's what they postulated, but they haven't really specifically measured that mechanism of action. Another point yeah. I wanted to point out as well is that when we were talking about endogenous and exogenous ketones, it when you do fasting or a ketogenic diet, a lot of times the level of ketones is very inconsistent between individuals. It really depends on how keto adapted you are, how your metabolism is. And some people fast for two days, they'll get to like 2.5 millimolar. Some people get to one millimolar. So the variance is very big. So another advantage that exogenous ketones have over just getting it naturally is that the the, the level of blood ketone levels that you will achieve is very predictable. So you have one shot, you have two shots, you know where you are going to get. One shot roughly gets you to like one millimolar, two shots will get you to like 1.5 to two. And a lot of our athletes, they'll have a higher dose because in performance, which we will talk about later, it's recommended to have between 1.5 to 2.5 millimolar to have that sort of physical performance edge on top of the, the cognitive benefit as well. I'm so happy that you brought this up because the other thing that I can say just from observation and from running thousands of women through uh, a ketogenic style diet is that there's also, and running men and women initially, and then really moving to focus on women, is that there's a lot of, there's sexual dimorphisms here as well, right? Yeah. So I would always notice, especially when it was like a husband and wife couple, you know, they're in the same environment, they're eating, you know, maybe they're not having the same amount of calories, but they're, you know, they're having the same kinds of foods and guys would be able to get into that like two millimolar, like 1.5, two millimolar. And so many women are like, I'm just like, you know, maybe they're using like a lumen or they're using like a keto mojo, you know, something where they're measuring their ketones. And it's like one point five. It's like maybe one yeah. if they've been fasting for five days, it's like 0. 0.5. You know, they're able to just crawl up that, you know, that sort of, you know, that get onto the sort of state of being ketosis or at like 0. 0.5. Right. And so I think for a lot of women, I'm so happy that you said that because I think that so many women, our tendency is to blame ourselves. Like we're not doing it enough. We're not, right. we're not being, we're not being good keto people enough. And I think that it's, there's, there are some sex differences there to be accounted for. Hormonal as well. differences, sex differences. I believe they have a paper that looked at ketogenic diet between male and female and postmenopausal female are more similar to male compared to yeah. premenopausal uh, female because if you think about it there's just biologically you know premenopausal you have other priorities than just metabolism right because you, you have to support the productive system and all of that so so taking all that into account a lot of women then started using exogenous ketones to augment their keto lifestyle so okay it's like if i'm not getting there enough because one of the study that sh uh, in the heart showed that when you take exogenous ketones just acutely even just one dose you upregulate all the enzymes related to keto metabolism meaning to say that yes it is sort of like, you know, yes, you are burning the exogenous ketones in that few hours, but you are also upregulating those enzymes, which means after those few hours, you're switching it back to your endogenous ketones and your body is willing and ready to metabolize that endogenous ketones already to be more cool. efficient. Yeah, that's really cool. I actually have to look up, is it, we're going to put the, put his link in the show notes. Is it John Little, did you say? Yeah, Dr. Jonathan John Little, Little from BC? Yeah. Okay, so that's really interesting because I have a theory on why ketones drive down blood glucose. And I don't know if it's correct, but this is just me totally hypothesizing, mm -hmm. which is, and it may run contrary to what you just said, but I feel like exogenous ketones may induce the release of insulin, right? So to your point around at the level level of the liver, we are st we are up right, or sorry, down regulating gluconeogenesis. Mm -hmm. That may be it. But with, if you can upright, if you increase the release of insulin, then that's going to feed back on the liver, which is now going to facilitate for glucose disposal, maybe at the myocyte yes. or or uh, or otherwise. They did um, measure insulin. Oh, they did. Uh, they did, and there was no difference in insulin. So insulin did go up when glucose <laughs> yeah. went up, but then when ketones kicked in, glucose goes down. But then you know, sort of uh, insulin was independent of that. Well, there goes um, that hypothesis. Yeah, All right. <laughs> unfortunately, <Okay. laughs> I mean, if you if you even think about it, um, ketones 
if you think about the Randall cycle, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Randall cycle, it's basically the upregulation of glucose metabolism downregulates fatty acid and vice versa. So if you upregulate fatty acid, the glucose will you go down because they, they, they both yeah. converge in the Krebs cycle, right? They both compete for the acetyl-CoA. Yeah. This is getting into the biochemical part, the acetyl-CoA yes, yes. spot. So yeah. ketones would technically go under the fatty acid oxidation, even though it goes directly into the acetyl-CoA because the main form of ketone that is metabolized is beta-hydroxybutyrate. And that yes. is reversible converted to acetoacetate, and then acetoacetate goes to acetyl-CoA. Now, if you are upregulating ketone metabolism, it only makes sense that glucose metabolism would go down a little bit because mm -hmm. you have enough yeah. oxygen, you have enough substrate to then produce ATP. So by logic, then it should send signal to the body, say, okay, we need to lower insulin because we can't take in all this glucose because we're already saturated within the mitochondria. That just that's just my my theory. Mm. Well, I like that one. And maybe we have to speak to Dr. Little about running running some of those studies to confirm that. And That's in women. Cool. I think, I believe those studies yeah. mostly are in men. So Yeah. Yes, I mean, that's a whole other topic unto itself around some of the differences in terms of female metabolism and male metabolism, metabolism for sure. Um, my other question with ketones is, do we habituate to ketones? Meaning, do the effects you know, does the same dose, like let's say you're taking ketone IQ, let's say, and you're taking 10 mils, does the effect of that, like you mentioned, you know, you take one 10 mil thing of ketone IQ and you'll maybe get to one millimole. Does the effects of that attenuate over time? Does that seem to remain consistent? Like what are you seeing with your, if there, if there is any literature on that, maybe um, there, maybe there isn't. So I have been taking it for about two years now, almost on a daily basis, even before we launched, because we had to do some, our own internal research. I personally haven't felt any diminishing return. And I think the where a good way to look at it is looking at it as a macronutrient. So if you supplement yourself with 25 grams of whey protein after your workout every day, you've yeah. been taking it for years. I mean, it doesn't decrease the efficiency of it. Do you know what I mean? Right. So that's mm -hmm. how I see it because it's not a pharmaceutical. It's not a antagonist or, uh, or, or agonist of a certain receptor. And therefore, there is no such thing as like oversaturation of that receptor or like a compensatory mechanism yeah. that counters it. It's essentially just a substrate that our bodies substrate. are yeah. programmed and designed to metabolize. And I wonder, so maybe just continuing on the whey protein example. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have a scoop of whey protein, let's call it 25 grams protein. As we age, we know that we become more anabolic resistant, like at the level of the myocyte. And that's, you know, mainly mediated through insulin uh, insensitivity. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there is a, you know, to your point, it's just like, it's a, it's a substrate for energy, but I wonder you know, and I'm thinking about obesity here a little bit. I'm thinking about sarcopenia here a little bit with that anabolic resistance. I wonder if there is a condition, maybe it is obesity, or maybe it is metabolic disease, some type of metabolic uh, disease where there's, you know, impaired, sh you know, shuttling, let's say, of the free fatty acid or the ketone body into the Krebs cycle or something. Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think it's very possible. I think it is very possible that age-driven dysfunction may affect the efficiency of using ketones. However, if you think about all of these dysfunction and deficiencies, especially when it comes to anabolism, anabolism and, and glucose metabolism, it's because of the oversaturation or overabundance of glucose in our diet. Right, yes. Whereas ketones, yes. exogenous ketones, you're taking 10 grams a day or like 20 grams a day. It's mm -hmm. not the same as taking, you know, 200 grams of carbs every day, for example, or 400 grams, you know, depending on some people's diet. So it's it's still up in the air whether that would cause any form of resistance in the body to not use ketone properly. But my hypothesis is that until we take that much amount of, or we take the amount of ketones that's equivalent to how much we're taking in terms of glucose, there shouldn't be any form of resistance because on top of, you know, the society these days developing all this dysfunction and insulin resistance because of the abundance of glucose, 
ketones actually provide an alternative route for the mitochondria to, to create energy. Because when you're talking about insulin resistance, you're talking about the cell being resistant to insulin and insulin binds to a certain receptor and that receptor activate pathways that pulls in glucose into the cell and then into the mitochondria, right? So there is a form of resistance that insulin cannot, uh, cannot attach itself to the receptor and therefore the glucose is not going in and, and just, you know, circulating the body and that's why you have a high blood glucose level. Ketones, on the other hand, enters the cell via a completely different route. It's, it's, it enters via monocarboxylase transporter, which is called MCT, not to confuse with medium chain tri triglycerides. Not to confuse with coconut oil. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's yeah. just a transporter yeah. called monoc yes. uh, monocarboxylase transporter, and it transports ketones and lactate into the cell. So what I'm trying to say is that when people are insulin, insulin resistance, that's why ketogenic diet has been so useful in reversing insulin resistance, helping people lose weight, or even just increasing insulin sensitivity when you couple it with exercise, because exercise yeah. itself increases insulin sensitivity, but the ketogenic diet itself gives your body the break that it needs so that it can reverse that insulin sensitivity. It's like, okay, I'm not being bombarded with a huge amount of glucose every day without rest. So now I can, you know, try and fix and regulate this metab uh, metabolic pathway. Yeah. And not that this is the right answer, but, you know, coming back to that example of whey, as we are aging and we're becoming more resistant to protein and the anabolic effects that it has, you know, the answer is to have more, right? The answer is to have more protein. You need, that's actually the only, one of the only macronutrient requirements that change as we age. We need to overcome that resistance that settles in in the muscle via vis-a-vis -vis the the insulin resistance that you've been describing so it's just I'm, I'm exploring all these thoughts with you because i know you're the scientist to be able to answer them because these are the thoughts and the answers that we don't have yet yeah. in the literature but you're you know sort of one of the more brilliant minds and you can sort of right. think through these problems really well on the fly so i appreciate i appreciate your um, your thoughtfulness here